Hello and welcome to the Mortgage and Real Estate Podcast by Pinnacle. I'm Chris Giannino and I am joined today by some very special guests that I'm looking forward to today. Um, Patrick Holleran to start. Patrick is the owner of McGurk's Irish Pub. This bar has over 20,000 square feet in the heart of Soulard. Pat has created an absolutely incredible atmosphere here. And it's, a, it's an authentic Irish pub with a patio that provides unparalleled ambiance. McGurk's was established in 1978 and known as one of the best bars in America, I kid you not. His accolades all over in publications around the United States. Patrick is one of those guys that would do anything to help out a friend. He's, he's, he's also a sports enthusiast, specifically soccer teams his daughter Ella played for, uh, which leads me to my next guest, the head coach, Michael Preusser. Soccer runs deep in the Preusser family with all four children playing high-level soccer two of them just finishing up a season as sisters at St. Louis University, which is unbelievable as a parent, I'm sure. Finally, my co-host, Pete Giannino, soccer dad of Emma and Lexi Giannino, both also playing high-level soccer. Emma currently at Dayton. This trio of Pat, Mike, and Pete have spent endless hours recruiting, training, retaining, and certainly having many late night meetings at McGurk's all for the kids very nice of you guys uh, so today we're going to do something a little bit different and we want to explore that dynamic and have some fun talking about some correlations between sports and business and success so Mike Pat Pete Welcome to the show. Uh, we're sitting here in the historic middle of Soulard. The place is closed, but we're in the middle of McGurk's. This place is unbelievable. Yeah, I'm so happy to be joined by my two best pals, uh, Mike and Pat, and especially uh, in this atmosphere. Gentlemen, thank you for joining us today. Thanks for having us. Appreciate the opportunity. Yeah, pleasure to be here with some great pals. Great. Well, we are... Like Chris said, we're going to um, explore um, a variety of topics today, but the at the at the heart of it, we're going to get this opportunity to do what we've talked about doing for quite some time, and that is memorializing one of the most s- incredible decades of our lives. And it, it started with our kids kind of getting involved in youth soccer, but specifically we're going to talk about an aspect of that decade, the most recent several years um, in which they played together um, in high school, but more particularly when Michael Preusser became the coach of the St. Louis Rangers. So, Michael, um, what a pleasure it has been to get to know you as a friend and as the coach of our children. Um, And I'm speaking for myself and uh, for Patrick, I know, for my daughter Emma, his daughter Ella. And um, tell us, by way of introduction, your soccer background, and and we were going to get into how you essentially became the captain of the ship for the Rangers. So uh, my background, I guess, starts when I'm a kid. Um, My dad was, you know, a soccer guy and played um, a lot of soccer in and around St. Louis. Uh, He got a little bit of a late start because soccer wasn't as available um, when he was a younger man as it is nowadays for for anyone and everyone. Um, But he actually was my youth coach uh, at the CYC level, kind of back when CYC mattered a little bit more than it does now. Um, Don't tell Patrick that. And we we were we were down in uh, South County at uh, Assumption Parish, which, uh, you know, was a bit of a, uh, you know, soccer powerhouse back in the day here uh, we go you know already anyway um fast forward to club soccer um 
played my uh, club soccer for Kudis, uh, obviously a well-known um, soccer club in St. Louis. Uh, they had a few youth teams, and um, that just kind of inspired me to, um, I guess my dad really inspired me to get into coaching. Um, and I started coaching club soccer myself uh, about 18 years ago with my oldest daughter, Erica, who's now 27. She was in third grade, and I started a team for her um, down in South County at the uh, Colping Kicks Soccer Club. And uh, shortly after that, I started another team with my son, Klaus, uh, who is 24. And... I had those two teams going, and then... Um, those were both at Culping? They were both at Culping. Now, yeah, that's correct. a Christopher Giannino. Uh, I spent a lot of time on those fields off of 55 there. That yeah. gets flooded now. I don't know if you yeah. guys are at those fields. Oh, they, we, we were, and, um, and, they, and they flooded pretty, pretty often. Um, and, but those guys down there did a great job um, actually making those fields um, a lot better than they were when when we first started and actually started playing some league games there um, and then against my better judgment I started a third coping team um, for my daughter Jess and she's currently just finished up her career at St. Louis U and is now headed off to grad school to pursue a uh, physical therapy degree um, so I had those three teams going and at some point, it, it became clear to me that I needed to move my daughter Erica to a different team. So she moved over to Lou Fuse her freshman year, which lightened my load a little bit. And um, and then my son did move over <clears throat> to Kudis himself. So I had Jess's team at Colping, and Nina was just getting started playing, and she played for... Marty Pike, her first year at Lou Fuse, and um, that's how that's how she got into club soccer at U8, I believe. Um, and so uh, eventually, I moved Jess's team over to Fuse, um, not only for convenience but also just to cast a little bit bigger net. Uh, we had a pretty good team, but we were needing to expand to the 11 v 11 format, and you know needed to needed to bring in some more players. So. Um, was at Fuse for a few years and uh, finished up there with the with the O2 group and uh, that team did well, had a lot of success, won a few state cups, went to regionals a couple times, and uh, and all those kids ended up uh, having the opportunity to play in college, and then uh, that kind of leads us up to my the baby of the family, Nina, who is currently a freshman at St. Louis U on the women's team and um, obviously the um, great friend of uh, Pat's daughter, Ella, and uh, your daughter, Emma. Yeah, it's kind of crazy just to interrupt you for a second. Like one of the, um, one of the mm. unique aspects of this arrangement and this group of men and is, is simply that they, you know, we've ha we have, like Chris said, we have spent <laughs> an enormous amount of time together but it is related to soccer but it, it it stems from not only the club soccer but high school experience they all attended Narek's high school so um you know pat i know <laughs> you you know the st louis high school scene from all angles better maybe than anyone but you know speak briefly about the uh, you know the Narek's experience and and how, how that kind of affected us and, and contributed to where we are today. And then, also, how did you juggle your, you know, your second job here at McGurk's <laughs> as owner? I appreciate that. I appreciate that, Chris. Um, and, and thanks for the nice, kind words about McGurk's in your introduction. My pop opened it up in 78. I've been down here responsible for over 30 years, and it's certainly a, a it, great and spot. And you use that word, responsible, loosely. Uh, <laughs> yes, yes. Um... <laughs> But the soccer has been such a great experience. It was just, it was so much time with myself and my little one, Ella. My older daughter, Natalie, played a lot of lacrosse, but at sort of a modest level, um, and certainly not the amount of time that the little one put into soccer. And um, and Pete, before I get to your nearest question, it just, it started so early. I can remember walking around um, the Lutheran South 
high school track with Mike Preusser, my great pal now, who I just met 10, 11 years ago. And I knew then he was a he was certainly a rock solid fella, and and I knew that that was a that was a good friendship that was starting. And Ellen and Nina are certainly great friends and still great friends today. And then and then Pete, our kids have been best pals. Emma and Ella have just been connected at the hip, playing every year of club soccer, every year of high school. It was certainly our kids. Uh, it, it was their birthright after games and practices. Where are we going to lunch? Where are we going to dinner? And it was it was a, it was a social outing. And uh, yep. it was so much fun. And then the Narinx three seasons, freshman year wiped out with COVID, but the three seasons at Narinx were just um, were fantastic. I mean, the whole coaching staff, Brian Haddock and Marty Tote, Cindy Burnt, the whole experience at Narinx with our three girls being great pals was tremendous. And they just they won an ocean of games, got to the, the 4A state final all three years, and we saw the tears in their eyes after each of the games. But but the, <laughs> the buildup to, to get to those – final games with so many wins and so much fun so it was um it was an incredible father-daughter bonding the whole soccer thing and the bonuses i got to i got to come great friends with peter alfred genino the second <laughs> and michael preusser <laughs> and christopher Gino, just genino along the way so it's, yeah, been good. We, it's been fun it's been a tremendous blessing and, and you know as, as we Everyone here at this table was at all three of those final um, games for the high school seasons, uh, and 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 despite the outcomes, uh, tremendous memories were instilled in us. And you know, and I think they, I had to, I had to, I had to interrupt Mike to talk about that because I think that high school experience um, was so unique, and it, it allowed. You know, with our daughters playing together and and ha- having um, that opportunity to also play together on the club in the club arena um, could not have could, uh, ha- necessarily had to benefit them. And you know, Mike was able to give them advice both you know off the field for high school and on the field for club. So you know, and during that time, the Rangers were kind of a club that had existed before any of us, you know, before Mike or Pat or myself were involved. And but at some point, Mike, let's let's kind of get back to where you were. At some point, um, you know, you, and you weren't even involved in the Rangers before we were. <laughs> no. So um, the Rangers were part of, um, I believe that the club was actually called the Woodson. City Rangers back, and a guy named Jim McPherson started the team, and they were actually kind of a rival of ours uh, over at Fuse when we had our kids playing over there uh, with with Marty Pike's groups, and um, and then Woodson became Sporting, and um, and Jim stayed with the team for a while, but his daughter was actually playing up a year, and at some point he decided to move her into the proper birth year, and when he did that. A guy named Rob Wilkinson took over as the head coach of the Rangers, and he had the team for a year. And it just so happened that the spring of that year was what is commonly referred to as the trapped year, and that would have been in 2019 when the girls were – our girls were eighth graders, but the other half of the 04 group were uh, freshmen. So um, what were you doing at that time? Oh, boy. (laughs) I was uh, I was a co- I was coaching um, at that point. I, st- I still had I still had the O2s and over at Fuse with my daughter Jess, and then I was the assistant coach of the Sporting Red Devils. Never heard of them, um, <laughs> right? That uh, that Nina was on that team. So in that spring, we had a handful of kids from that team and a handful of kids from the Rangers, including your two your two daughters and. We combined that group to play in the spring, and I think that's when the idea kind of hatched. I think uh, Rob had asked me if I wanted to help coach that spring. There were a lot more Rangers than there were Devils. Um, of course. Trap kids. <laughs> and so, you know, we started running training mm-hmm. sessions together, and I got to know Rob, and, uh, you know, we became um, we became friends, and, and you know, we talked a lot about, you know, the X's and O's, but we also, um, you know, talked more on a broader scope about the club and the age group and, 
and trying to, you know, see, we, you know, we could see that there was a nice balance with that group of, uh, of younger O fours and, and we could see that there was potential there and the team did really well that spring. I think we won, you know, most of our games and, and there was a lot of, a lot of potential there for expansion and, and Rob was the one who actually had the idea to maybe create a third team. Well, the, yeah, in all fairness to the devils, I mean, the devils had so much success and, um, attracted so much attention to the club at that time for that for the age group that 04 age group that right. um it necessarily brought new kids to the club just to take a look and see if they could become part of the devils and there were enough rangers that could become part of the devils but but i i don't want to i don't want to ignore that success they had because it was really important to uh, making it available for three teams to be to um, be available at sporting sure so so essentially that that tryout season after um, a lot of the kids were coming back from their first year of high school the older o fours we ended up having a tryout and I think we had somewhere around sixty kids show up and we knew we had enough kids for three teams you know three three quality teams so we had tryouts, we had kick arounds, we had a lot of kids out, we watched a lot of kids play, we identified talent and um and we we kind of sat down and and you know divided the kids up into three groups and um you know Bob and I were going to continue coaching the Red Devils and you know I assumed Wilkinson was going to continue to coach the Rangers and then we were kind of looking for a coach for that third group but about two nights before the final tryout um, Rob called me and he said, Hey, I had an idea. Uh, he said, I think, I think I want to coach the new team. And I think I'd like you to coach the Ranger team. And so I thought to myself, do I really want to, do I really want to take on a third team right now? I've, I've been involved with three teams before and it was hard, you know, it was a lot of, you know, cause I'm not a paid coach. So you're going to work you know 40 hours a week and then doing the soccer stuff at night and but but having been able to have the opportunity to work with a lot of these kids in the spring and and seeing a lot of the kids that were the tryouts it, it was a it was an interesting and um kind of an exciting opportunity so long story short uh i end up taking on the team and you know year one begins and you know we we were able to get um a lot of kids who ultimately were good players on bad teams is my best way to describe it all kind of came together to uh to form our group and so a lot of the first part of year one was you know creating some reassurance with the the old existing ranger parents and the new parents coming in that you know i had their kids best interests in mind because none of them had me for a coach before so it was you know, there was definitely a, um, a, oh, break, yeah. a break in period there, but I had two guys that uh, that are sitting at the table with me here whose daughters were also on that team um, who did a lot of. Um, yeah, we, our phone yeah. bills were extremely high during that. Yeah, time. well, it's, it's one thing to identify talent, and then after you identify talent, you have to um, recruit the talent. And then after you recruit the talent, you have to uh, retain the talent. So. It's it's to make a business correlation. It's a lot like running a business. I mean, you. It's one thing to find the people, and then you have to attract them to come to your team, or you have to attract them to come to your to your business to work. And then at that point, the job is basically to either train the employees or the partners or the or the players so that they're good enough that they could leave and play anywhere or good enough that they could leave and start their own company or work somewhere else. But you have an, a culture that is strong enough that everybody wants to stay. And that that's a big, that's, that's a, a job that is, is a major part of being a coach and a major part of being a business owner. And, um, I think there's a tremendous amount of correlations between, sports leadership and business i mean un unbelievable amount just it so in preparation for for if you want to call it the real world um the trials and 
ups and downs that you experience throughout that um, is great preparation for the next stage, which which is where all those which is where all those girls are at right now. Yeah, for sure. You know, and and I think um, like Mike said, there's a lot of there's a lot of on the field stuff that goes on, but a lot of behind the scenes stuff. And and I think the person I think we gotta you know it. Everyone knows this, but it's never been recorded. I think it's time to I think it's time to record it. You know that. Um, you know, Patrick uh, Halloran has a gift, and um, certainly a gift to um, communicate. So, um, and that communication was. Um, I, go ahead. I, I would like to hear. I would like to hear a story about. I mean, I've, I've sometimes yeah. I would be, be at work with Pete, and Pete <laughs> and I would be working, and I'm just kind of, you know, a little bored doing what I'm doing for a moment, and I just say, "Can you call Patrick and put on speakerphone for a minute <laughs> so I can go down and." learn a couple things on <laughs> on what you guys have been doing but patrick have, have you i mean you weren't afraid to pick up the phone and and find out about a girl that had some talent to bring her into the team were you you ever call any doctor <clears throat> no <laughs> uh no i was um i was not ashamed to pick up the phone to call people that i knew or people that i did not know People about, you wanted to know about coming to our team and I was immensely proud of our team and we always had a great nucleus and I, I knew we had a great coach and I knew we had a great core of kids and so it was it meant a lot to me and I just we kept just like a, every team you're always looking for a couple kids and Chris you asked about a couple stories in that trapped year that Mike talked about we played a team a couple of times and they had a few kids on that team. They they were a little bit, we were a little bit above them on a on a talent perspective. But they definitely had a handful of kids that I thought would fit. And um, and frankly, Rob Wilkinson met with uh, with Kurt Shane and and um, some of the kids from his team came over. And they, they're great kids and great players. And to this day, are our great pals of all of our girls, uh, Emma, Nina, and Ella. Um, there was another game that uh, we were playing a team from Jeff City. <laughs> I'm watching the game, and and I'm seeing that there's two kids on the Jeff City team that are better than the rest of their team. So I'm calling our coach saying, hey, you need to talk to the coaches. And I'm calling mid-game. So and, and, and it was Rob Wilkinson at the time. Have to do. And, and he answered the phone, and he's like, what? Because the game's going on. He's, my parents calling him. He's kind of used to me bothering him a little bit <laughs> but we had a great relationship with rob is fantastic and so i said you need to talk to those parents those two kids and he knew what i was talking about i was like those are the coaches kids and we ended up getting them to the team and um uh, we were always a solid team and mike just brought the team to an, another level but back to your original point chris no it was uh, uh i felt a great attachment to the team so the, those kids driving an hour and 40 minutes to practice no biggie. Two or three times a week. Right. They, they, That's dedication. And that happened for years. What are you for looking years. for when you guys are looking for players? I mean, could you find correlation with similar attributes on, um, you know, people that you want to ru help run this company and, and top-level players that you're looking to? I mean, competitiveness comes to my mind. You know, people that want to compete. Those two girls probably stuck out as, as competitors. They wanted to win more, you know. Yeah, I, I know which two girls you're talking about because I think I was there the first day they came. Yes. <laughs> I don't, um, I don't know that much about the nuance of soccer, and but I do feel like I can look at, especially the younger generation. I feel like I can look at a, a game with nine to fourteen year old girls and pick out who really sticks out. Most of it is just speed and athleticism, but but you can you can certainly see some of the IQs on the field, and so looking for that stuff and then passing that along to the coaches and and then if they can convince them to come over it's it's a win-win yeah it takes a lot of work to to make it all happen you know I, got, I i've got one other one other story just to show you how how there was no bounds i i actually called the parent of a kid that we were looking at who was an assistant coach at a college an hour and a half away and i called him on the i didn't have his numbers so i called him on the university athletic director line and asked for him and introduced myself and he said oh okay and i said i, I i've seen your daughter and i i think she'd be a great fit on our team and um, 
she never came to our team, but I, I, I think he was at least um, impressed, if not shocked, that a guy 90 or 100 miles away was calling about his dog. Well, that's, that's, that's a theme that we've been talking a lot about. And that's Today the, in particular. That's the power of asking. <laughs> right. The power of asking changes lives. You know, but it takes a lot. People are like, if, if it was that easy, everybody would do it. But then if you think about it, when was the last time you did it? You know what I mean? It, whatever it is, whatever the asking is. I think that, you know, just to build on what you said a little bit, you know, and talking about retaining players and keeping your team relevant, you know, you have got to get better. You have to take steps forward as a team. And the only way to really do that is to, is to – add the pieces that you need to, to succeed. And so, you know, the, the youth game and, and the recruiting is, you know, is, is very competitive because there's a lot of teams, there's a lot of options, especially in St. Louis. And so, you know, sometimes you got to go a little further to find, to find the right kids. And, and, you know, we, we were able to do that. Um, you know, after year one, we, we had two goals our first year. One was to get out of group play at State Cup because the team had never done that. And I always try to set goals that are attainable for, for any team I coach. And our second goal was to get promoted to Premier One in the Midwest Conference, and we were a Premier Two team. We did accomplish both those goals. However, we did lose in the semifinals of State Cup, and we, um, we did get promoted to Premier One. And, and even with you know, reaching those goals, there were, there were uh, some kids that, you know, decided to go in another direction the following season. And that was probably the most difficult uh, few months of the evolution of this team was the time between year one and year two. And it almost ended up being... I think I think it I almost ended up being the end of the Rangers, but I, I'm going to let you and Patrick I just wrote talk that down it, because it needs it's a story that needs to be told. It's, it's yeah, it's be, and, and pretty amazing, and it has to be told because so just to paint a little bit of the landscape here, um, when we arrived at McGurk's tonight, uh, we it's closed. So we um, had to get Pat's attention on the phone, and, and he um, opened a window on the second floor to acknowledge his presence. And um, in that room upstairs, um, he and I met in that second, in that uh, time in between the two, first year and the second year of the Rangers. And um, we had a lot of meetings, but this meeting was of the more serious nature. And um, so Pat... Let's uh, let's revisit that. You know, we were we were we were faced with a pretty significant situation that most people probably don't know, uh, but it's a story that that is appropriate to be told right now. So, let's have it. At that time, um, let's let's talk about uh, what happened when I came up to your office and we had a phone, couple phone calls and discussions. Yeah, we were. You got to cut me off if I'm getting my timeline incorrect. But when we were up there, we were talking about because we we knew that we were short on kids. Right. And there was another opportunity that we could have gone to another team, another club. And it, you and I were talking and we've been on the team. We're the second and third most senior members, our kids being the members of the team. Sometimes I like to include <laughs> yeah. myself on the team as a dad. Rightfully so. But our, but our kids are second and third. Uh, senior members on the team, and and number one, the, which we call her the OG, is Allison Schrumpf, and her parents, uh, Ken and Jody Schrumpf. Jody's been the manager, uh, a fat, fantastic one at that, and Ken Schrumpf. We kind of nicknamed him Papa Bear because he's just he's the most senior dad on the team. I think you and I were talking, and and we were we were a little unsure, and I think we remember calling Ken, and he he was he's he's at work, and he and he was a little shocked by the call, and. I told him we were in the office talking about leaving, and he was he was a little bit shocked by it. And he expressed like, "No, we're 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 good. We just need to find a few more kids. Like, go find five kids, you know, like they're walking <laughs> down the street." Like, just, <laughs> well, you know. and, and the problem was the kids. Some of the kids that were leaving, they were significant. You know, they were kids that played ninety minutes. They were important pieces. You know, two in particular yep. that come to mind. Uh, you know, the center back and, and captain. Yep. And <laughs> and then um, 
and then one of, and then one of our main you know goal scorers and kind of the motor that uh, at that time ran the offense. Right. Sounds like I, a lot of opportunity. I think <laughs> I think we had about we it, we had about nine or ten kids, and uh, you, you know you need eleven kids on the field, and you at least need a few subs, and so we were we were we were naked short. And we were and, tight with Mike at this time too. We were, <laughs> we were, and Mike was Mike was willing to do anything. Hey, if we're short, let's you know let's make a decision to you know to to do something else and 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 pete ackerman you and i just we made the commitment like mike is the right guy and this nucleus is the right nucleus and we just we have to find four or five kids and uh and and we did we made that happen and then that got us over the hump as far as enough kids well it was the last day of tryouts and we were because of the pandemic we were 65 miles away uh, yeah. out out past wentzville because we couldn't play in St. Louis County. Wow. What was the name of that town? Uh, uh, I want to call it Moscow uh, Mills? something Hill. Flint Hill. Flint Hill. Flint Hill, that's it. Yeah, I think it was exit P yeah, off of uh, 40. And, yeah. and I know it took You me had to want it. Yeah. I found a field. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. So so we're, we're having a tryout out there, and we've got um, – and that morning I got a call. One of the kids that we really were trying to retain was on the fence, and I got a call from her dad saying, "Hey, we're going to make the jump. We're going over to Fuse. Uh, you know, should we want we want her to play in the GA, and that opportunity doesn't exist at Sporting because, you know, she was basically told she wasn't uh, good enough to be on the GA team at at our club, and so so we we're going into tryouts. I know." I know I'm, I'm several kids short, but I also got a couple kids from Fuse coming that day, and I felt pretty good that one of them was going to commit. Wasn't sure about the other one. Hadn't even talked to her parents yet, but knew she was a good player. And then I'm about 10 minutes into my workout, and I get a, and my phone rings, and it's Rob Wilkinson, and he's over, he's over at some other field. And he says, hey, he said, I just got off the phone with the Jeff City kids, and they're on their way to Flint Hill right now. <laughs> so... I know these two kids are coming, and I know these two kids are, are. And these are the same Jeff City kids that Pat was referring to earlier. Right? Uh, and I know, I know these two kids are first eleven kids, right? Yeah. Yep. And without even thinking twice about it, so I know they're coming. Some, I know, well, somehow I, they ended up in a blue, uh, Blues game box that night too. I don't know what the hell happened. <laughs> it might have happened. They, they, they may have, but I, I, I knew what my play was going to be because I knew we had to get these kids, and then I had to try to get these two uh, fuse kids. And if we could get those four kids, we were going to be in great shape. And, and, we would, and we would find the other kids we needed, you know, probably two more kids to make it work. So, <laughs> so they show up, and it's, uh, it's, it's Yanni's dad, Alan, and, mm -hmm. and we're talking afterwards. And I told the girls, you know, you guys, you know, I'm offering you a spot right now. You are a great fit for this group. And, you know, we've watched you guys play for the last couple of years, and we'd love to have you on the team. What do you guys think? And, and, and Alan kind of looks at me and he says, well, he said, you know, they're old enough to make the decision themselves. He said, we're actually supposed to go to work out with Scott Gallagher here in about an hour, but uh, I'm going to let them make the call. And they looked at each other and then they turned around and said, we want to play for you. Wow. So that was a great feeling because I knew yeah. once those kids committed, I turned around and then the two Fuse kids said we're in. And all of a sudden, we're back in business. And that then, had to be inspirational for you, too. Just a feeling of confidence and let's go. It was. And, and I knew in that moment, you know, this potentially is going to be a great year. We're, we're better than we were last year. We've got a lot of good kids. And then we, we also uh, promoted a couple kids from the third team up to our group, right. which, which filled in the gaps. And then, uh, and then the one kid who was so sure they were going to leave, um, you know, some unforeseen events happened uh over the course of that week and she ended up coming back too so now we're sitting there at like 17 18 kids and we're loaded again yep and 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 I, from that day i don't think we ever looked back it sounds like you you guys just you know you had a situation and you could either look at it like this isn't ideal or hmm. this is the right situation and we're just going to burn the ships and make it work so it sounds like from that day at McGurk's, you guys just decided. Once you decide, uh, you cut off all the other options and you just move forward with 
the way you were going to proceed. And then when you have one person doing that, it's going to work. But when you have two, it's it's even going to work more. And when you have three, it typically can't be denied. So when you cut off all other options, you have you have three people working in one direction, and everybody's on the same page. I mean, the results speak for themselves. The accolades of that team were uh, phenomenal. I think you had buy-in from from everybody and we're getting the most out of every player and like you said they came from all different places uh, maybe they're on winning teams maybe some of them weren't but now was a big opportunity for everybody to to step up and shine and uh, it sounds like you guys did that yeah we, we we actually i think that's a great point chris we we really did i remember patrick even um <laughs> had the phone in his hand and you tell me he said, you tell me what we're going to say. He started dialing the number. We had no idea what we were going to say. And then we made a decision, and we were like, we're going with him, you know. And I, I was doing yard work when the phone <laughs> rang, and um, I had I had a modified schedule at work because of the pandemic. So, you know, my phone rings, and I see it's you guys, and I'm like, oh, they're definitely calling to tell me they're they're moving on. Right. You know, and, and the conversation went something like, uh, we've really been talking things over and you know of course pat you know is leading the charge so he's going to leave me on a cliffhanger and he kind of paused and he said and, and we want you to be our coach so right let's what go do we, what do we need to do let's go and yeah we just you know it it definitely uh was a great feeling and you know i felt like there's got to be some kids out there and you know the the two jeff city kids like it's almost like they dropped out of the sky you know on yeah. the field at flint hill that day and it was <laughs> some people refer, refer to it as miracle saturday but we won't their their yeah. presence is missed yeah the, 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 <laughs> we, we know how those guys feel well, yeah. i'll tell you what when you have when you have uh people to your credit coaches specifically and uh and uh management here <laughs> but uh when you have a coach that is enthusiastic and that doesn't mean you have to be jumping up and down clapping and yelling enthusiastic just in um the details and mm. that that is um seen by the players and that's who players want to play for so that makes a, a big difference that's when you get you know 100 percent effort and that type of those girls you know they were accountable to each other and accountable to themselves as well i think you know everybody was, was on the same page as to um they wanted to win championships. Yeah, we had a special goalkeeper at that time, too. We probably haven't really identified Fantastic. her. Fantastic. But, um, you know, she was kind of a new Rangers addition at that time. Um, and, Mike, you, you know, just briefly talk about, um, you know, you talk about attention to detail. I know Katie, you'd tell some stories about her, her warm-ups and stuff. You know, that kid had an attention to detail, didn't she? She did. And Katie was, was a kid um, who had you know, a more incredible work ethic than any other kid on the team. Yep. Honestly. I mean, over the four years I was uh privileged to coach her. Um she her goalie trainer was the same trainer that um that we used for my son Klaus when he when he was playing goalkeeper and uh his name is Dwayne Kleppel and he is just a um a very dedicated uh, another guy who's just kinda in it for the love of the game. Um been around a long time. Been around a long time knows how to train keepers uh, you know my son didn't start playing goalie until he was like 12 or 13 years old and and by the time he was in high school he was he was a good keeper you know and i, I attribute a ton of that to the time that Dwayne put in with him so so katie had that same opportunity and and she would train you know we had our training sessions and if we weren't training she was training on her own with Dwayne. i mean she she trained four or five nights a week she didn't skip yeah and she would stay after practice and she would always ask kids on the team hey will you stay and, and shoot and, yeah you know let me work on this let me work on that and you know the the two biggest parts of her game um that that really kind of took her to the next level um and and i i think it speaks to the culture and the personality of our team was one her her ability to communicate and her confidence to talk to her to her team because she really year one she really didn't talk much and i and i challenged her with that i said you know if you want to play in college you got to be talking the whole game and you know and i and i told her this i said you know i know you're a super nice kid but when you're on the field you have to be a bitch yep you know you have, yep. you have got to challenge she's your, the keeper you, right you yeah are, you're the general yeah you know and everybody's got to follow your lead it starts with you you see everything 
And the second thing that really brought her game to a new level was her foot skills. She <laughs> um, was a little nervous about receiving the ball at her feet year one, even a little bit year two. But, man, year three and four, like, she was as good as anybody receiving the ball at her feet. And, and a lot of that was attributed to when we did have training, I always made her do – any of the possession drills that the team was doing, any of the foot skill stuff we were doing, she was right in there doing it with them because, you know, if you know the game, you know that, you know, successful keepers can play with their feet. So uh, Katie's a super, super kid. She's uh, playing at uh, Drury University. And um, had a lot of and, success and, and there. And, yeah. gonna have a, and it's going to have a great uh, college career there. She just finished up her first year there. And, uh, yeah. and she's just... Um, she was a, really such an important piece uh, to really a quality kid. I mean, just, just yeah. family just a, was good, and 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 you know, before we dive into dive into the numbers, um, you know, Pat, you and I, you know, without I don't think anyone would be surprised because when you weren't around or when you were occupied, everyone was asking me what what do we know about this team. Um, who's playing what position? Who's you know? Mike was the Mike was the captain of the ship, but you had an opinion on everything. Tell me about the tell me about the culture and and of the um, the Rangers. When we are on road trips, and you know, because most of our games at some point were on the road somewhere, you know, and um, and and you and I would have our conversations, and then. You know, I'd have to deal with a handful of parents, and you'd deal with a handful of parents. We had a lot of friends on that team, didn't we? You oh know? yeah. I mean, that was a that was a tremendous opportunity for us to hang out and watch our kids play, and and we'd we'd drive them or fly them somewhere on Friday, and we might see them again on Monday if it wasn't on the field, right? <laughs> yeah, all, all all those trips were so special, and on all those trips early on and, and, and later in the years when they quote unquote mattered more regionals or nationals, but all those trips, we'd always size up our opponent. We'd say, who are you <laughs> playing? And we'd try to get as much info as we could. If it's a local team, we could always get who's on the team, what they do. Uh, out of town team, we were asking people in hotels, but the, the but whole, what did you do? I mean, a SWOT I, analysis. I, I can't imagine. I, I don't, you need to at least, this is your, I mean, you always knew what to expect from these, but you tell me, Oh, uh, we we got we probably are a two goal favorite on this team. <laughs> Pat, Patrick knew all the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, and that's a huge part. And that team was from Minnesota. <laughs> no, well, that was more me looking up their history, it's, it, and you got to do a little digging online to find what a team's done and what their history is, and then sometimes you got to even follow up and do a little more digging and see what their roster is. Um, so I, I, I did I did a little too much of that, just sitting on the phone in a hotel, and we're all hanging out. So yes, a, um, lo a, lo a lot of people think that from year two, three, and four, I coached that team by myself. <laughs> but the truth of the matter is, <laughs> is, is, is he was like kind of like the silent partner, and we would talk a lot. It was it was incredible throughout the week and throughout the season, and we would we would look at teams and we would talk about the upcoming event, and we would you know we would discuss. Um, you know, a lot of strategies and and. What if know. we're down two to one and but it's late in the game? What's but, the formation? And, and, <laughs> and Patrick has a, a unique ability to ask. You know, the thought-provoking questions that every coach needs to be asked by his assistant. But when you don't have an assistant, you know, you you got to have somebody there who who understands. You know, not a generic question, but a specific question. And and with his knowledge and his interest. Um, we covered those bases, uh, and it was pretty awesome. Uh, I, I never met anyone like that. Like, what, what, what? Uh, it, it just. Um, What's that gift about? No, <laughs> it's no gift. The, the root of that was just, this is this is my kid's team, and I took a ton of um, pride being on it. And as far as Mike, I, I appreciate the partnership um, <laughs> comments because you've been coaching for three or four years, and you probably. Never had a parent so invasive. I'm talking to you about everything. Well, you, you know, I had that one rule, and obviously, I heard earlier in this podcast that you did not follow that with Wilkinson. But <laughs> you were pretty good. You were pretty good for four years with me. I think. I, I think maybe you called me once during a game, and then it never happened again after that. Oh, I was definitely over involved with the coaches. From I, I, there were a few conversations we had together. We said, "Do you think? Do you think I should tell Mike this right now?" I go, 
no, I don't think you should tell my kids <laughs> right now. <laughs> right. Let's talk about some of the decisions that you guys uh, disagreed with uh, wholeheartedly. <laughs> 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 well, I will, I, will, I will talk about one. Actually, it's not, a, it's not a wholehearted disagreement, but I do. Pat and I had many conversations about formation. And, you know, what I don't know if formation matters in soccer because I can't. Sometimes the formation is just how you s- start the half. Right. And then sure. it evolves into soccer. Whatever is needed. But there are many times where we um, we consulted one another about whether the three five two was the appropriate move. <laughs> <laughs> and and I'm, 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 that's going to lead me to kind of the next step before we get into the numbers. The next step of the Rangers, um, I mentioned the three five two because at some point along this journey, the Rangers became kind of an offensive team, and you know, as as the final Rangers um, developed, the the look of it. Yeah, one one of the, and I'm going to ask Mike to explain this now that we've opened yeah. up the box of naming some names. Before <laughs> I get to one name that I'll that I'll throw to Mike because he knows that story. But of these kids that we've talked about that have come over, the two Jeff City kids, uh, Georgia Pardalos and Yanni Clark, great kids, and we met their families. It was such great additions. And two or three nights a week we talked about driving in from Jeff City, the couple kids from Lou Fuse, Ella Resch, and Haley Stockhouse, and just super kids and families. And then and then the, the families that we see so much today, which are our great friends, uh, the Kristen O'Shea and Anna Shane and Rosie Klein and their families, um, they, they, just, they just really – those – all those kids really completed the team. You talked about Katie Fitzler, just fantastic goalie. Um, one of the kids that joined the team was um, was Maddie Bowman. I know Mike was instrumental in, in getting her to the team, and she sort of supercharged the offense. But before Mike talks about that, as Pete, when you and I are talking to Mike about maybe a three-five-two or a three-four-three, and you know Mike historically liking a lot of the four back systems but if we ever were going to play a game with three backs <laughs> my my daughter who's a wing back would get in the car and say dad I, what is mike doing playing three back because of course she's a she's a wing back and she feels more comfortable when there's four of them back there and and i would say i, I don't know ella just go out there and play and compete so i had nothing to do with i 100 percent was passing the buck it was mike's decision but but when when uh, when pete and i are breathing down mike's back about uh, about three backs for a, a game here and there. You well, know. the team became really talented at near, you know, a, as it as it got towards the last two years, and you know, the addition of of Maddie Bowman and the addition of Mike's daughter Nina, b- it became seriously, uh, you know, it was a, 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 a offensive riches in a way, and we had a great for, defense too. <laughs> no, for sure. When you take when you mention those two kids, the the. Uh, Nina and Maddie, and then you throw in Pete, your daughter Emma, and then Rachel Skyberg came over. She's a great, great player. player. Yeah, and um, yeah, Quinn Conroy. Just we, there was yeah. enough kids in the front five or the front six, and then we could start really putting up some crooked numbers on teams. And so that was hence the, so, the pressure of the three back. Great, great, great summary there, Pat. And you know, Mike, I get Pat gave you the uh, opportunity there to to reveal some of that you know that success you had with the recruitment of Maddie Bowman. Yeah, so that goes back to in the sp- in the spring of uh, or in the summer of 2019. Um, I was I was obviously coaching the Red Devils, and we went to we went to regionals uh, up in Saginaw, Michigan, and we had a few of the Ranger kids playing with us uh, in that in that tournament, and, and knowing pretty pretty sure that those kids were going to be making the move in the fall to that team. But there was another team from St. Louis that had made it to regionals that, that season. And that was the, uh, that was the Scott Gallagher, uh, premier team. That was Maddie's team at the time. And they, um, they got out of their group, um, on a tiebreaker and got in the semifinals and came up against the, uh, our friends from Milwaukee, the, uh, SC wave. And in their semifinal, they fell, uh, I believe it was seven to nothing. And, um, and then we played and won our semifinal, and then we got in the final the next day, and we we beat the wave. And um, I was I was driving home from from regionals. Uh, you know, obviously uh, happy flight home. We had just won regionals, uh, 
and things were looking good. I knew that the uh, Rangers were going to be my team in the fall. By we, you mean the Devils? Yeah, the Devils. Yeah, and so, so my phone rings, and I and it's and it's uh, Maddie's mom, Colleen, and and she's and she called, and and you know, um, was looking, you know, looking to see what Maddie's options were. So, you know, we had some some good, some great conversations about what we were doing over at Sporting, and. Uh, and the opportunities that would be there for Maddie, and um, and I knew that you know bringing a kid like that uh, over to our club was going to be um, just a great addition because you know you always look for kids that can do things that other kids can't do, and and you look for <laughs> um, you know you look for things you can't teach, you know, and so um, you know eventually Maddie ended up coming to the Rangers as her primary team that year, and. Um, you know, the rest is history. I mean, she was uh, a problem for every team we played. Um, she was often double double teamed. For and, sure, at least. And, <laughs> and, get, and got marked a ton, but still found ways to score goals and win games for us. And she was really, in my mind, other than maybe Fitzler, the only kid on the Rangers who could completely change a game all by herself. Yeah, what I, what I loved about the way Maddie plays is she, she didn't care if – she didn't score uh, on a particular attempt. I mean, she she she'll try she just, and try. <laughs> she'd just do it again and do it again, do it again. Wouldn't wouldn't stop trying because she didn't score in three attempts. It was like it just didn't care. Relentless, and eventually one was going to go in. The good news on that is that uh, Maddie was a star for St. Joe, and um, <laughs> our three girls here that went to Narex, we we were um, <laughs> our, our our girls were proudly. <laughs> Six and zero against St. Joe's um, <laughs> for the three years. So it was pretty nice. <laughs> like that, I, you know, I know that Maddie kid. She's she's uh, my daughter's roommate right now at Dayton, doing well at University of Dayton. So, um, but yeah, Maddie had um, tremendous success for the Rangers. Goal scoring, everyone knew knew about her, but eventually couldn't stop her if she played. You uh, know, I eighty. Can, I can I can tell you, I talked to a plethora of college coaches about maddie at a lot of our events yeah so unusual style of just offensive um displays and generally ended up with a goal it was just for sure something something really unique so so mike as you as you sit back you know and um and not maybe i'm gonna actually i'm gonna you may have a different perspective so i'm gonna start with patrick on this because as a parent and and as a general manager, um, that's uh, <laughs> that that um, title is just coming out today. Um, you know, what do you think? As you you know, what's the, we had a, a number of great moments, and I mean, I think Mike probably knows all those moments with statistics. But what do you think as a parent was a great moment? You know, some of the greatest moments you you witnessed. Well, the you mentioned the the the, the general manager comment. I listen that that just. That stems from us being, that was my, not me uh, over-involving myself in the team. Well, actually, it was a little <laughs> bit. But we were just, we were shorthanded, like, for a couple years, and we just needed some kids. So uh, there's hey, that. you as don't far, need to explain as far, it. As far as, yeah, but the other parents are listening, and other parents on, the, so. Oh, yeah, this is a big surprise <laughs> to them. <laughs> Yeah. Man, nobody nobody knew until right now so, that, that that's, that was your role. So so best moments there were so many of them, but certainly the regionals in St. Louis and the other team we've talked about the Devils, which we got so many friends on that. Um, yep. There was one regional and um, they were one of the favorites to win it, and we were just uh, we were not even supposed to be there. Sixteen teams in St. Louis, and the Devils were were supposed to win it. And the next thing you realize is um, we get out of our group and the Devils don't. And then we end up beating a team, and Mike will probably correct me on this, but we end up beating a team in the semifinal that had our number, the Libertyville team out of um, uh, out of out of Chicago. Chicago. And I think that's the that's the game when Emma just basically, you know, Maddie scored a clutch goal late, Emma scored a clutch goal late, and uh, winning that game I think in double overtime. And then the final game was you know Yanni Clark's header off um, off the Kansas team, but that was hundred percent. We were not supposed to be there. We were not supposed to win it. And it was in St. Louis, so family and friends and the kids. That was the first like big time success for the team. So, so, so to build on that a little bit, there's there's talking about you know the regional championship is one of my favorite things to talk about. First of all, because I think it was the major turning point in the evolution of the Rangers. 
I and agree. Why was that the turning point? Well, Pat touched on it a little bit. We, we as the number two team. In number club, two in the club. But number probably two, nice 16 a, in the. As, <laughs> as the number two team in the club and probably in the, in the low, lower quadrant of the tournament. Because we, we snuck in on a wild card. And um, to outperform the top team in the club in a tournament is, is kind of unheard of. And um, and we did it. Uh, we did it in style. We did it convincingly. We, you know, our scores um, uh, in group play. We won the first game three to one. We won the second game three nothing, and we won our third group game six to one. And so, so we were going into, you know, the semifinals with. Uh, uh, I'm going to say twelve goals for and two against. That that's pretty convincing. And then we came up against a team, like Pat said, that had our number. It was a Libertyville team. And they had beaten us the previous November uh, on a cold day in Warrington, 7-3, uh, to three, and, <laughs> and just kind of took it to us, you know. Um, so going into that going into that semifinal against them, it, it felt like a big, big hill to climb, and it felt like it was going to be a really hard game, you know. Um, but... Uh, the kids were up to the challenge, and 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 we end up winning that game three to one in overtime, and then um, double overtime, and right? yeah, and and we won the final one nothing. And and one of the most interesting statistics for our team coming out of the uh, regionals was we gave up a goal in the first minute of the tournament, <laughs> and we scored a goal in the final minute of the tournament. Mm -hmm. And and that um, is symbolic because I think that was. Um, the moment when the kids began to really believe in themselves as a group. Um, I think that the transition from winning being a possibility to winning being an expectation happened that week. And I think that um, uh, they now had a sense of um, collective confidence, competence, and cognizance. Like, you know, I like to, like the three C's of yep. success, you know. And, um, and they had a region two championship to back up that that confidence and that and that collective um feeling that you know we can beat anyone that was and a... and so am know, i from... remembering this correctly is this the year that um we played in the state finals for soccer high school soccer and then the next day we traveled to Rantoul, Illinois, to play in the play-in game Absolutely. for regionals. Yep, against the with, the, against with the, all uh, our kids having played nearly every minute of a uh, was it yeah, the, the, penalty yeah. kick soccer? Or no, I think this, that was just this was, was our, our this first was our sophomore year. Yep, so our first yeah. state final soccer they played extensively in the game. They then had the. It was late at night. They went home. They had to wake up early in the morning, drive to Rantoul, Illinois, to play in a play-in game for regionals. And luckily, Maddie Bowman was well-rested because she was a St. Joe kid, and she scored <laughs> two goals in that game, and we she won two nothing. <laughs> It's we we it, the Maddie Bowman the train here. For, so no, well, but that was no, but our Saint Nar Joe. But the Narinx girls. That's a backhanded compliment. But the, but the Narinx girls. Yeah, to your point, Pete. Uh, beat that was sophomore year. Uh, beat St. Teresa's in that semifinal, and that's yeah. when that's when Emma drib dribbled the keeper as the seconds were yeah, that was fun. going off the clock to win three one, and that was that was um was the first game. Then the following day, played that Dominic team our sophomore year, and they were that team was a monster. That yep. was the that was the Ben Boydell Larson. Right. They had every, I mean, they had kids that we mentioned McPherson, his daughter Kaylee's great player. Yeah. She's a freshman. They were just loaded. There's probably 15 kids that went D one on that team. And um, hmm. and our, our kids played great and ended up losing. That was the first of the the three, uh, the three times. And that was there. a night game. And then they woke up, went to Rantoul, played the play-in game, and then played regionals after yeah. that. Yeah, three three games in probably forty eight hours or something. Yeah. And it, it was hard for the kids. Like we're in the car driving up to Rantoul. You have to win this game. <laughs> and they're still drying their eyes from the <laughs> right. state final. And the parent, we've already kind of moved on. No, but, but you have to win. Game. Yes, yeah. you have to win. And we got two subs. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Yeah, what, what, the, so that that is a great that is a great moment and and memory and and I guess as a result of winning regionals, you know the Rangers had had a taste of then the national tournament. Um, yeah, you know, so that, yeah. So we went down to nationals for the first time and and got like 
the worst draw that any team would ever want to get and and ended up uh, going 0 and 3 and uh we were just pretty pretty overmatched um in a, you know we we were in the games for a while and then and then by the time we were halfway through the second half we were just overmatched and we ended up losing all three games so so we knew we had work to do and we knew we had to get better uh so we rolled in in the year 3 uh we definitely loaded up our plate um and our goals that year were to win state cup win regionals win the npl nationals and and then get back to the usys natties and uh and you know and get out of our group uh as opposed to the previous year so we did win state cup that year um we did not win regionals uh but just a side note on that um you know the midwest regionals is is a very very difficult tournament to win and i and i attribute that to the fact that in usys most of the you know a lot of the best teams are from the midwest so the midwest regional tournament is uh about as difficult a tournament as nationals really for that matter depending on what your draw is would you agree with that mm -hmm. pat yeah for sure um and we did get to the nationals for npl we lost uh out in denver um in the finals um and, and took second there and then we went to natty's that year for usys down in orlando and we um we won our group so we did achieve that goal and then we uh we ended up getting beat in the in the semifinal by a very good uh team out of chicago uh, called galaxy who we had a lot of history with so um they won it all that year, didn't they? They did. They won. They won it all. They beat Penn Youth in the in the final uh, by a, by the same score, three nothing, that they beat us by. So they were they were far and 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 clear the best team, you know, in in U eighteen that year. Um, and so so year three, you know, our challenges in year three were we were we had you know one of our one of our best center backs coming back from a, a an ACL and and you know I knew we had to bring her back slow so her. Her minutes were very limited as the season wore on, and, and she did play a lot more at nationals. But she, I, I still don't think she was 100% yet, um, you know, that, that whole season. So, And then we had another kid that got hurt, um, another one of our backs. So our back line was really depleted. But, uh, but you know, we figured it out, and uh, we, we moved some kids around, and we still had a great year in year three, but we just didn't quite uh, achieve everything we wanted to. So... Um, Going into year four, um, things got really interesting because uh, at that point we were able to get a few kids who um, had played on the uh, GA team the year before, my daughter being one of them, um, and coming and playing with the Rangers full time. And then we also got Quinn and, uh, and Julia Ligori. Um, who had been on the Rangers for years and went and played with the GA team for a few years and then came back for their last season to, to play with the Rangers. And, and really, uh, you know, um, our fourth season was the best team we had, definitely, on paper. And we had a lot of, a lot of options. And, you know, I, I, um, I know that before that season there was a lot of behind-the-scenes conversations and work being done by uh you know people within the club that wanted some of those kids on the rangers to play on that on that on that composite team and you know it was kind of funny i i spent a lot of time actually talking to so most of our kids are committed by that point um to to some great programs and you know i started getting pinged by these college coaches asking me why why is so-and-so not on the GA team? Why is she playing on, on your team? And, and my simple answer was, well, because do you want her to play on the best team in the club she's in? And, you know, their answer was always yes. And I said, well, she's on the best team. <laughs> and they're like, well, how, why, how you guys are the second team? I said, well, that's, a, that's what I call the second team fallacy. And, <laughs> and you know, um, I'm sure there's people out there that uh, don't agree with that, but you know the proof is in the pudding, and and we actually played the, you know we played the um, composite team, the GA team, in a friendly, and after 60 minutes, uh, Rangers were up four to one, and uh, and that was all she wrote that night. That we're gonna shut it down. They it got shut down after 60 minutes, <laughs> and uh, and we never played again. So. Um, 
you know, that that uh, that second team fallacy was uh, kind of proven that night, I think. And uh, kids were confident. And then they had those great additions like you spoke of. And that's just going to instill a little more confidence. Yeah, right? And I think this, too, I think when kids are on a team and they develop an identity and, and they have that going back to what I said, that turning point after year two and they they're comfortable and they and they like their teammates and you know there's more there's more to this club soccer thing there's more to this than just always trying to be on something better always trying to climb you know and sometimes where you're at is good enough and I think we proved through all the commitments uh and college opportunities that our our kids were able to achieve that you don't necessarily have to be on a GA team or an ECNL team you know, we had kids leave our team because they were told, if you want to play D1 soccer, you got to get on an ECNL team. And, you know, and it's not true. I mean, we proved it, right? I mean, uh, 11 D1 commits off the Rangers, you know, that's a pretty good number. That's crazy. Yeah, uh, that's that, that's a that's a that's a big number, Mike, and, and you should certainly be proud of that. And there was other kids that – could have gone to play you talked about the center back that got hurt Kristen O'Shea she was fantastic she could have easily played played D1 anywhere there was so many other defenders my daughter Ella Rosie Klein that had multiple opportunities to play places and uh, they just elected to move on with their academics um, but one one other addition uh, that came the last year was Ella McElhinney and, and just a great kid and uh, was a fantastic center back for the Rangers and also played with our girls at Narinx Kind of a great little historical thing is that our three kids and Ella McElhinney were the were the four co captains at Narrick's the senior year. Mm-hmm. Just great friends, all on the same club team and same high school team. And um, I, I want to. We always try to, you know, it's always good to hear a story. And I, I think of the Ella Mac addition uh, because it reminds me of a story when, you know, unfortunately Patrick and I, you know. We got to know each other's thoughts sometimes, oh, uh, and it was too much. It was so funny. He called me when I, I don't know if he called me or he nudged me at a, at a game, and he goes, "Do you know what I'm thinking?" And I, he goes, "You're not going to believe what I'm going to say." And then I looked at him and I said, "You think we should have Ella Mac on the Rangers?" <laughs> no, but he's a you're I, damn right. I can elaborate on that a little bit. You know, I mean, so Ella was on the Rangers on year one. Mm-hmm. Okay. That's exactly right. And she came to tryouts before year two and said, you know, I'm going to play defense this year. But the problem we had was we had so many kids that were quote unquote defenders. I just at that time didn't really see her as a defender and she yep. didn't, she hadn't played a lot of defense. So she went over to Fuse for two years yep. and played on their GA group and, and played defense. And, uh, you know, I think, uh, I think she got a lot of help uh, from from Aaron and and stuff yeah. on on how to do that uh, and how to transition from yeah. you know predominantly playing offense to defense and and then played it at Nerex for a couple of years and just it was a good fit to bring her back but you know the nice thing was is somebody if somebody as a coach I've always thought you know if somebody wants to move on you just you know you just kind of give them your blessing and and right. you always keep that door open right because yep. you never know what could happen later and and you know and and Mac ended up coming back for her for the final season and, and rejoining the Rangers and it was perfect because that was a hole that we needed to fill and it and, made sense and she was a perfect kid to do it you know and and a, and a great kid and and you know here we are 6 months 6 months Sorry, more like, yeah, I guess about six to eight months removed from the end of the club soccer career. And I, I, I'm, I'm saying that just to put us in perspective to when we're talking about this, because the, the soccer for the girls, as far as the club team and the Rangers are concerned, ended um, in, in late July of uh, 2023. And... The girls played every game that they could have played in their high school career. And they completed their club career playing the very last game they could have played. And we were we were in uh, Orlando at the ESPN Wild World of Sports Complex, which is a tremendous facility. We were, had the privilege of going there for the last several years. And um, so, Mike, tell us about the last, you know, the last... Uh, 
Les Hurrah, where we were there for a week in, <laughs> a week in Orlando, um, getting that opportunity. So, yeah, I mean, our ultimate goal going into our last season, you know, we knew we had the players, we knew we had the talent, we knew we had the depth. And we felt like we can we can win a national championship with this group, and so that was the ultimate goal was to was to go down there and in our last game together to be a national championship. And for me, it was it was my last game coaching. And and I if I had a dollar for every time I talked to Pat on the phone and said, hey, wouldn't it be cool if my last game coaching was a national final? <laughs> you know, <laughs> it'd be the last uh, game working too. Yeah, <laughs> um, daily. Yeah. <laughs> And 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 to see that you know actually come come to its you know fruition through all the work of the kids and and you know getting the wins we needed to get and and getting to that point was was an incredible opportunity and um, you know uh, we we had a little bit of bad luck uh, going you know we played such a phenomenal semifinal and uh, you know because we had had three really tough games uh, our semifinal opponent was the uh, Casey Scott Gallagher team uh, coached by you know a good friend of mine Dan Brown who you know had a great working relationship with him over the years you know coaching against each other as opponents and and he had he had put together a really nice team for their final run too and uh, you know Strong as all a, they were strong all the time. A, as, yeah. I, as I said a few minutes ago about the strength of the USYS being Midwest, you know, three of the four semifinalists at nationals were Midwest teams. You Crazy. Had, you had our team from St. Louis. You had his team from Kansas City. And then you had the Minnesota group. Um, and then Penn Youth, Playing of Penn course, Youth. Yeah. Uh, coached by a St. Louis guy, uh, Billy Betcher. So, wow. Um, Good representation of this town and this area. I mean, For sure. And, uh, and so... Um, you know, we had a great showing at that semifinal. You game. get to that semifinal game, and, and you and you've tied this team twice and beat them once uh, through Midwest Conference play, through National League play, regionals. and regionals, and now you're in the semifinals and nationals, and you know that it's go time. And you know, um, I had a great feeling uh, during <laughs> warm up. I, I just felt like it was going to be our day, and uh, and sure enough, it, it was. You know, our defense was was very good that day uh, it didn't give them much and we scored pretty early to go up 1-0 and then we just built on that and uh, we ended up ultimately winning that game three nothing uh, the downside was I think a few of our kids got uh, you know kind of kind of bit by the heat that day and um, you know we, sure. we came into the final maybe a little more depleted than uh, than we would have wanted to be and ultimately ended up losing um, two to one um but you know um it was it was an incredible ride that the kids took us on you know you as well <laughs> mike with the kids but myself pete all the other parents um it was a it was a it was just a fantastic ride all the years and pete to your point it's a great point we played the last game in high school but then the rangers club team playing the last game i mean so many rocks unturned so many memories so many big wins um so many friendships on the team so so many of those kids are so close now um it was it was all worth it and the only thing this winter when it was icy in january was <laughs> we were supposed to sign up in like the sarasota league or something <laughs> and, and get down there more because we we're down there every every winter so yeah um, we i think we went to florida uh in that four years i think we were down there nine times between nationals and national league and showcases and so on and so forth. I think we made nine trips to Florida, and they were all, you know, great, great, mm -hmm. great weeks and weekends. And, uh, you know, to to get to that last, to play the last possible game you can play as a as a, a, a club player is it's it's awesome because not a lot of kids can say they did that. Yeah. And uh, I think a lot of people. I guess my final word on the Rangers and, and that four year run, um, uh, you know, some might look at our final game and, and, you know, see that it wasn't our best day and, and look at the project as a failure ultimately, but, uh, we just blame the coach on that game. That's all. That's uh, right. It's coaching. And, and I, and I would take uh, a fair amount of that blame, but, I would, <laughs> but I would also challenge our detractors, uh, to show me another, uh, youth team whose collective body of work, uh, IE, you know, overall success, collegiate commitments, reputation, et cetera, um, achieved more in, in that short of an amount of time. 
and and I don't, I, I can't think of a team or, or call to mind um, any team, to my knowledge, at least in the St. Louis area, that's done that. And and I'm very proud of that. And uh, you should be. Yeah. And, 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 and the kids, and you know, the kids did the the bulk of the work. It was all about the buy-in and the confidence and you know relying on each other and uh, playing for each other and it was it was an awesome experience um you know and when i when i sat down knowing this podcast was coming up and, and jotted down some notes and and kind of looked at our numbers and as i call it rangers by the numbers um we we accomplished a lot a, as a team you know we um we went we had three nationals appearances uh, once we made it to the semis the other time we were a finalist we won the Region 2 championship in 2021. We won two state cups in 22 and 23. We were a finalist in the U.S. Club Nationals in 2022. Uh, we won the uh, National PRO League in uh, 23 outright. We were two-time Midwest Conference uh, champions in 20 and 22 uh, Fall League. And we were the NPL League champs in 21-22. Um, and when you look at our college commitments, we had 11 kids go on to play D1. Two D2 commits, one D3, and one NAIA kid. And then, as, as we mentioned, four to five other kids who definitely could have played but uh, chose not to, ultimately. Wow. I mean, pretty spectacular. You know, the, the evolution of the Rangers is just – we're talking about it because it's important to us as parents. It's important to you as a coach. It's important to our kids. And, and hopefully, you know, this memory will, will serve us all well down the road for sure. Um. Gentlemen, any last words before we sign off? Oh, I have one. I asked the question and I answer it. It's uh, this podcast is going to be published here in the next couple of days, and um, we are uh, right on the heels of, of the Mardi Gras celebration. So um, please uh, enjoy Mardi Gras here uh, at McGurk's, John D. McGurk's. Um, Pat, what are we, what are we doing for uh, Mardi Gras uh, on? Saturday is it February 11th, 10th? Yeah, I think it's February 10th. It's 10th. This, this Saturday, that's the Grand Parade. Um, this past weekend um, was a nice success. The Taste of Soulard on Saturday and the Dog Parade on Sunday. So there was a lot of people down here. Um, next Saturday will be great. There's people from all over the the Midwest come in, and um, the band that um, that we have playing is a, is a group of four super guys and the band's name is jig jam and it's um jamie dahi gavin and kevin and uh the first three jamie dahi and gavin are all from ireland and kevin buckley's a talented local musician but the four of them represent jig jam and they've been last couple years they've been traveling um, all around the country from la san francisco vegas dallas new york chicago miami anywhere you can think of and the only reason why i bring up those cities is that when they were traveling for a couple of years, they they realized decided that, that they they decided that they needed to have a home base and pick a home. And of every place that they played in and they were, all those cities I mentioned and more, they picked St. Louis. And so, for a lot of the problems that we have here in the city of St. Louis with crime and all the other things that people talk about, people forget, people forget about. There's some there's some fantastic stuff in the city, and I'm not even going to go into all that now, but. Here are three guys from Ireland that have been coast to coast, and of all the cities they went to, they picked St. Louis. So no, it's crazy, and I, I've I've uh, been lucky enough to um, be a, a spectator for Jig Jam's performances here at McGurk's, and it's it is my favorite performance in town. So you know, I, I know you'll be busy saturday pat but you'll take a few more people right a hundred percent come on down there's plenty of room we got outside party. opportunities too and then when it if it gets if the sun goes down and you need to come inside uh you're welcome inside at john d mcgurk's um in the heart of sular right along the parade route i believe right it's good stuff yeah and i expect both of you guys on future podcasts that mcgurk's is the first thing that you speak about. <laughs> <For sure. laughs> thanks gentlemen thanks guys